prepared to make history. Why did I say that? Because uh, I didn't know I only have 10 minutes, so when I prepared my presentation, I actually got uh, about 50 slides. So if I can finish 50 slides in 10 minutes, that's history making for me at least. So, uh, okay, just one word about Six Ways. We're not a localization company, all right? We're a game publisher. We are actually been around six years, uh, and most recently, we're helping a lot of Western developers to actually bring their games to Asia, in particular Japan, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Does that work? All right, here we go. Uh, because time is really uh, very short, so I'm just really dive into it and look into why localization is important, and then how can we do a good job. That's why. All right, so I think most of us here actually do games in English, but if you're only doing games in English, that means you only kind of like capturing about less than one third of your potential market. Um, this is actually from uh, New Zoo. And if you look at North America plus the English speaking countries like Australia, um, UK, and also New Zealand, you're potentially capturing about maybe one third of the total global market. As, my, as there are like two previous uh, speakers have already mentioned, you know, Asia is actually growing, in particular Japan and China. And that's already in overall represent 45% of the market. And another stats is that 82% you know, of the growth coming this year is also coming from Asia. So not only that Asia is already the largest, it is still very much growing uh, very quickly. So uh, again, from New Zealand, if you look at the top 20 iOS countries uh, by revenue, uh, people always mention about Japan and China being the top three. But you know, interestingly, actually, there are actually seven Asian countries in the top 20. Uh, in particular, you know, we mentioned North Korea before, but you know, in particular Taiwan and Hong Kong, they're actually 10 and 12 respectively. Looking at Google Play, again, seven Asian countries in the top 20, and in particular, Taiwan, number five, and Hong Kong is actually number 10. Uh, obviously, you don't see China here because China, you know, uh, Google Play is not available, but if you really add up all the Android uh, revenue uh, in China, I'm quite sure it's actually in the top three also. So I think you know people always mention about Japan and China being very, very attractive, but I would like to present you another perspective and I'll say Taiwan and Hong Kong is actually blue ocean. You know, Japan and China, yes, they're very big, but it's also very competitive and it's also very complex. But I think, you know, um, it actually doesn't really take a lot to actually also localize your game and try to capture the Taiwan and the Hong Kong market, which are really blue oceans and a lot less competitive. So here's another data from a Distimal, and it actually shows uh, the Clash of Clans uh, revenue in Japan and how it actually improved once they have the Japanese version launched in June 17. So I guess the why is obvious, right? I mean, the non-English speaking market is actually very big and it's growing. And if you localize your game well, actually it can significantly increase your revenue for your game. So let's go to the how. Now I kind of break it down into four different elements. First of all is the tax. So how many of you have heard about this? When you talk about localization, it's not just the tax, right? I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this. So let's take a look at a few slides. Um, I actually picked two very good uh, you know, gaming companies from Finland. Obviously, one is Rovio. So the one on the left is actually the English version Angry Birds, and on the right is actually uh, Angry Birds in Chinese. I think it's actually the work done by Spelman, right? Now, I also picked, uh, of course, Supercell, right? So this is the latest game, uh, Boom Beach, and on the left again is the English version. On the right, this is the Japanese version, all right? Notice the differences. This is a slide which uh, talks about, you know, buying slot. This is a slide that shows when you actually achieve victory. And this is the loading screen. See the differences? Well, you know what? Here's the good news. When they launched the Japanese version, actually download increased by 70% in a week. And more importantly, revenue actually increased by four times. Now the good news is that if you look at those slides and you compare the left and right, you know, sometimes it is just about the tax, you know. You don't really have to localize that much. But I guess, you know, it's also maybe, it's only if you're only from Finland. Um, I think there's something about the way they design the game and also the characters. It's actually very, very universal. So you don't really have to localize uh, everything about your game for the sake of localization, right? So you have to really look into the game and see, you know, what's really kind of like relevant to the local audience. 
Now, the second part I want to share is really uh, the art and the UI. So, uh, this is actually a game that we publish and we develop, uh, and I think, you know, the art is a way of communicating to users. So, uh, this is Raven with Fair, it's actually a game uh, on Facebook that was actually very popular in the US, and when we bring it to Japan, this is what we've done. You know, we actually localize those characters into a more kind of like Japanese anime cartoon style. Another example is the work that we've done for a Russian developer, uh, Game Insight. Uh, this is a hidden object game called Mystery Manor. Again, you see the differences in art style. That's actually very Western. And then when we bring the game to Japan, you know, the style actually change. Another game is a mobile game called Strike It Omega. So these are the original cast of the characters. And knowing this game is actually targeted to more uh, the, the male audience, the young teenagers, this is what we've done to the game. You know, this is the case where we actually change part of it, you know. Because, you know, I'm thinking when I was like young, uh, actually, I like to look at those characters more than the one on, on top. All right? Not only that we change those characters, we actually also change the logo. Another example, this is a game that we developed, casual puzzle game. So this is the queen that we have in Wonderland Epic in, in the US version. And this is the queen in Japan, the knight, the wizard, and, you know, the bad guy. So even like in Japan, like, the bad guy actually looks kind of cute. Uh, again, not only that we change the characters, we also change the logo. So it's not just the art sometimes, it's also actually also about the UI, the user interface, right? So uh, here's an example. Here's a confirmation page of a Chinese game. So as you can guess, you know, confirmation is usually either you confirm or you cancel. So a quick test, like how many things A? The blue represents confirm and the red represents cancel. Right? If your hands, what about B? Actually red represents confirm and blue represents cancel. Fewer hands. It is actually B. So, you know, I actually, uh, even in Hong Kong, you know, usually, you know, blue is good, right? Red is off. But in China, it's actually different. So these are the kind of, like, you know, local cultural differences that you have to be aware of when you're localizing your game. The third one is actually live operations. So, you know, when you launch a game, congratulations. But, you know, it is actually just the beginning. In fact, actually, it's not even the beginning, right? Because, you know, sometimes before you launch the game, you actually have to do some work. So this is an example, again, from Robio. When they launched Angry Birds Epic in Japan, what they've done is actually the pre-registration. So for users, they want to generate those DR. If you pre-register, they give you actually a special item, which is uh, only available in the Japanese market. Um, so this is kind of like a Ronin where it's like a Japanese warrior. So, uh, you know, they've done a lot of good work in terms of before even launching the game. And you know, live operation is really important. Not only that it will increase your revenue, but also more importantly, it actually helps to retain your users. I think you know there are a few talks in the morning that talks about increasing cost of CPI, and you know retention is now actually getting more and more important. And live operation is one of those uh, you know elements that you actually pay attention to improve improve your customer retention. So one of the few things that we've done actually uh, by bringing games into Japan is that to include new features. So uh, a bubble shooting game uh, available in Facebook, and when we bring this into Japan, we actually added in a PvP element, which again is very popular in Asian countries. Um, another example is uh, a hidden object game that I mentioned earlier. Is, uh, there's a Sakura scene where, you know, when the cherry blossom is baking in Japan, we actually also added that into the game. Um, and you also have to think about pricing. Right? It's not just about changing the local currency, but understanding that you know, the affordability of your users may be different in different countries. And one of the tactics that have been widely used in China is that they introduce a starter pack, you know, which actually is a lot uh, lower in pricing, but they actually allow the users to try out different things. So I think the last point really is, is the intangibles. You know? It's the, how do you understand the culture? Understand actually what's trending, what actually works, and I think more importantly, it's also very important to understand what's actually offensive and try not to put that into the game. Uh, so I just use an example, you know, China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, we're all Chinese, so you think maybe we are actually the same, but actually we're actually very, very different. So because it's a World Cup right now, so I just want to share, you know, what about the, the, their FIFA World Ranking, right? So China is 103, Taiwan 176, and Hong Kong is 163. Yeah, so we're different, but I guess we're consistently bad in football. <laughs> and uh, spoken language, China, Mandarin, Taiwan, Mandarin, Hong Kong is Cantonese. Uh, written language, okay, simplified Chinese in China, traditional Chinese from Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, GDP per capita, 
you see the differences. So, you know, don't think about Chinese as being Chinese. We're actually all very different. Uh, messaging platform, we chat for China, Line, Taiwan, and then Hong Kong is actually a WhatsApp country. Uh, social media, uh, we have uh, Weibo uh, and, and China, and then Facebook for Taiwan and Hong Kong. In particular, for Facebook penetration in Taiwan, it's actually 65%. What that number represents is actually uh, you know, on the top of the ladder in terms of the worldwide penetration for Facebook. And Hong Kong is 61%, it's actually the second in the world in terms of Facebook penetration. And China, zero, because it's actually blocked in China. So because of that, you know, we actually use a lot of Facebook Connect uh, when we're uh, you know, bringing games into Taiwan and also Hong Kong. Uh, one of the games that we've done is actually a simple puzzle game. Uh, you know, the Hong Kong version and the Taiwan version is actually different. Not, although it looks like the same, the language is the same, because uh, the cultural is different, so the question sets are actually totally different. Uh, obviously, other than Facebook Connect, we also have like, you know, Facebook integration within the game. Uh, this game actually did very well. We're number one for five weeks in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, and it became a social phenomenon. So, you know, uh, celebrities actually talking about that, posting on Facebook, and also, you know, even IKEA on your, on your right is actually using that to promote their, their own branding. Uh, some more examples about like retail chains in Hong Kong, and also people are actually using that as uh, doing merchandise. So, uh, running out of time, but uh, I guess basically the key takeaway, you know, basically that's the title of the echo, localization. Why is it essential to think local? But I think that's not entirely true. I think it's essential to think global because of the global opportunities, but it's very important to act local. Uh, so either you hire a local person uh, in the territories that you think is important, or you work with a local partner to hopefully bring your games uh, into a more relevant uh, context uh, while you're trying to bring your games into the global uh, arena. So with that, that's my contact. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much more time, but uh, I'll be around and happy to actually share more experiences or talk to you. Thank you.